Late last week, the city of Regina cleared an encampment of unhoused people in front of City Hall. It was a shocking display of callousness and cruelty from my hometown. Well, I now have an update. You see, when encampments are torn down like this, the first question that has to be asked is where are these people meant to go? Encampments emerge for a reason. Services are able to be coordinated, people are connected with their social supports, and there are people able to administer treatments like naloxone. Well, the government of Saskatchewan brought forward what they seem to consider to be a solution, shipping them out of town. Specifically, the government of Saskatchewan has sent at least five former members of the encampment to the town of Balgoni nearby. They booked them rooms in the motel, specifically seven rooms until August 8th. This means that they are completely cut off from the support system. By car, Balgoni is about 25 minutes to a half an hour outside of the city, and there is no public transit option to get from Balgoni back to Regina. This is literally just a case of out of sight, out of mind. And the Saskatchewan government refuses to even discuss this. They won't even admit they're doing it. They offered no comment whatsoever. They won't even answer the question of how are they supposed to get back to Regina? And if this whole story seems vaguely familiar, it's because this sort of cruelty has been done by the Saskatchewan government before. You may remember in 2016 when the Saskatchewan government was giving unhoused people one-way bus tickets to BC. They don't care about helping people, they just want it to be somebody else's problem. This is vile. This is just hiding the people who need support in another town to give the appearance that you've helped them. Nothing more. This is shameful. And yet another reason to be incredibly disappointed in the Saskatchewan government. A new international study on the four-day workweek shows incredibly promising results and featured a 100% success rate. So let's talk about it. So this is a surprisingly large study. It included nine Canadian organizations and 32 U.S. companies, and it was run by Boston College. And what they found was incredible. Seven in ten employees reported less burnout, and self-reported mental and physical health scores improved by 17 and 12% respectively. But the benefits weren't just on the employee side. Before this initiative, one of these organizations would reach about 70% of its objectives. Now they're reaching more than 90%. And on a 10-point scale, employers rated the program an average of 8.7. Employers also saw a revenue increase of 15% over the trial period. Well, worker hours dropped from 38 to 32.97. Literally everybody won. 91% of the managers involved supported maintaining a four-day work week. Every piece of research that we see suggests that the four-day work week works better for everybody. And while this can't be directly applied to trades in every case, it applies there too. Things like physical exhaustion and burnout exist in trades. People having access to more rest time is going to improve productivity during the time that they're there. The trick with jobs like that is to make sure that the spaces are filled during those days. You need to hire more people to make sure that the work still gets done. But this is an incredibly exciting development, and I really hope that we see more workplaces move towards a four-day work week in the near future. Because in a lot of cases, the 40-hour work week that we have right now was developed under the assumption that one person in the household would be working full-time and one person would be at home full-time. These days, it's a lot harder to maintain the home and to do all of your life stuff because work stuff eats up so much of your day. The four-day work week would benefit everybody. If you wanted another reminder of just how bad our government is at basically everything, look no further than COVID-19 rapid tests. You know, that pandemic that's still underway? Well, since our government has largely given up on testing, we're now sitting on 39 million extra rapid tests. The federal government really has no idea what to do with. Why does the federal government still have this many rapid tests? Well, for starters, it's because they stopped distributing them. It seems like strike one. They stopped sending the provinces at the end of January because the provinces didn't want any more. Why didn't the provinces want any more? Well, because they wanted to wash their hands of COVID. Slow down the testing, the numbers stay low. Things look bad. Or if you're the Ontario government, cancel it so that people can start buying their tests in Shoppers Drug Mart. How else is Galen Weston going to pay his bills? So while Canadians are paying out of pocket for rapid tests, the Canadian government is left scrambling to figure out what to do with 39 million extra. Options include shipping them abroad to countries that need them, since apparently Canada doesn't need them, even though COVID is, you know, still happening, or paying the manufacturers to take the tests back. Why? But anyways, Health Canada insists they're doing a great job in donating these to nonprofits, public institutions, and charities. But this is such a clear example of how our governments approach COVID. They would rather pay to not give 39 million tests than find out how much COVID is actually circulating in the country. That's where we're at. We will pay or throw them in the dumpster instead of using them. Awesome. If you're a Canadian who feels like you're financially falling behind, you're not alone as real disposable incomes of Canada have fallen significantly over the last year, with the average Canadian's disposable income dropping by 4.8%. This is how much you have left after things like taxes. And the reason for this is very simple. Wages have climbed, but so too have expenses. And wages haven't come anywhere near keeping up with it. So the average hourly wages across Canada increased about 4.2% in June. And annual household income increased 6%. 
But the reason why disposable income is dropping is because costs have gone up. And when you adjust for population, disposable income dropped by 0.5% last year, and in quarter one of this year dropped 4.8%. Canadians are losing purchasing power fast. And there are a lot of different reasons for this, but one of the biggest drivers is inflation. That, paired with high interest rates, is pulling more money out of Canadians' pockets. Canadians are not getting their fair share. Corporate profits are at record highs, and Canadians' purchasing power is diminishing. This is why we all need to stand together in labor power, because Canadian workers are being left behind. Solidarity. So, this quote gets brought out against Justin Trudeau pretty regularly. The budget will balance itself. So, you know what the incredibly frustrating thing about this is? What he was saying in this moment was an incredibly conservative thing to say. You know what the full quote is? You see, he was asked about a commitment to a balanced budget, whether or not he would commit to getting rid of the deficit in a given year. And the exact quote he said was, the commitment needs to be a commitment to grow the economy. Then the budget will balance itself. That's classic conservative thinking. The idea that the way that you pay for the cost of things is simply to grow the economy, to grow your way out of problems. This is the conservative philosophy. Take on debt in order to grow the economy and focus on the growth of things like private business. That's what Trudeau was saying. I disagree with him, but it didn't belie some sort of fundamental misunderstanding of the economy. It belied a very conservative understanding of the economy. Still wrong, but not for the reason you think it is. So thanks for coming out. This is such a ridiculous opinion to hold towards unhoused people, that they've somehow chosen to be in a tent because they can be drunk or high. This is just moralization around homelessness. Like, our opinions towards substance use are heavily colored by privilege. Like, do you think that people who are in big fancy houses are completely sober the entire time? Do you think they put wine cellars in those places for decoration? Like, substance abuse isn't solely the domain of the unhoused, for starters. But there's more here. Like, if you think that somebody doesn't deserve their basic right to housing because they drink or do drugs, then you're going to be putting a lot of people out on the streets. Because the majority of people in Canada consume alcohol, and a very large portion consume drugs. Legal or illegal. And like, if somebody drinks in a tent in front of City Hall, we're not okay with that. But if somebody drinks in a tent in a campsite, that's perfectly fine. Your thinking about this is deeply rooted in privilege. Getting mad at somebody for drinking or doing drugs in a tent when they have nowhere else to go doesn't really hold water. People are doing drugs and drinking in their houses all the time. They just have the privilege to be able to do it in a safe location. Have some compassion for your fellow human beings. Do better. Yesterday I shared a bunch of chaotic AI-generated images of Doug Ford absolutely housing a bunch of bees. And this person weighed in asking if they could see Doug Ford as a bee. So I reached out to my friend Craig from Canadian History X, give him a follow, tag below, and requested some images of Doug Ford as a bee. Wanna see? Because I'm pretty sure you do. I like the pollen boa here, it's a nice touch. I really appreciate this one. It's got big Ghostbusters vibes. Like, this one feels very much like one of those Japanese town mascots. Magnificent. I also like Agent Smith in the background here. This one, I don't even know what's happening here. His arms, like, turned into sunflowers, and he looks like some sort of bee-based astronaut. A beastronaut, if you will. <laughs> this is, this is the pro wrestler edition. This is what happens after Goldust leaves his cocoon. This whole, no, just, come on. Amazing. Although, shout out to AI for including the zipper. And last but not least, whatever's going on here. I'm really curious what the logo is. But again, shout out to my friend Craig from Canadian History 8. These are magnificent. They're getting a lot of buzz. I wasn't aware that was something a person could do. This person thinks that the government buying a bunch of COVID-19 rapid tests and then not using them is socialism. Because socialism is when government, I don't know. Here's the thing. Socialism is not that. At all. Socialism is not when the government does government things. Socialism is about your relationship to the means of production. See, capitalism is when capital owns the means of production. When the wealthy own it. Socialism is when the workers own the means of production. Things like cooperatives. Communism is when the state owns the means of production. It has nothing to do with whether or not the government does governmental things. This has been Socialism 101. It's hard to believe I'm walking through the ruins of the first ever city. Because I'm not. That's in Iraq.